So as Fran says, we now have a fantastic panel moderated by Michael Bertwistle. Michael is Associate Director for Law and Policy at the Ada Lovelace Institute. His role explores the legal, regulatory, and other tools needed to govern AI and data effectively. Before joining Ada, Michael led the regulatory work stream at the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation. Please join me in welcoming Michael and the panel to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Michael Bertwistle, Associate Director at ADA. Um, we've just heard what the stakes of getting AI governance right will be. To help us understand more about whether safety is the right framing or a useful one to borrow from for AI regulation and what we're going to need to move forward, we've got a fantastic panel this morning from across academia, civil society, regulators, and government. I'm joined by Professor Shannon Valor, Bailey Gifford Chair of the in, in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh, uh, Yolanda Lanquist, Global AI Governance Director at the Future Society, Jill Whitehead, Online Safety Director at Ofcom and previously Chief Executive of the Digital Regulation Corporation Forum, Deb Raji, Computer Scientist and Mozilla Fellow, and Emran Mian, Director General for Digital Technologies and Telecoms at the UK's Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. Thank you so much all for joining us. We have a big panel today, so I'm very keen to dive straight into their perspectives on these important questions. We do have the luxury of a little over an hour, though, so no doubt we will have solved AI regulation by 11 o'clock. <laughs> I'm going to ask the panelists to each take five minutes to give us some opening remarks. I'll put some questions to them, and a little later on, we'll be opening it up to the floor. Shannon, would you be willing to kick us off? Glad to. Uh, so I think, first of all, I want to point out that safety, obviously, should be one of our primary concerns when we think about AI governance. Uh, as I'll point out, I don't think it's the only value that we should be focused on. Um, but let's just talk about safety for, for just a moment. One of the things that I think has distressed a lot of people who've been working in the field of responsible AI or ethical AI for the last five to 10 years, some of us longer than that, is that first of all, there's a lot of knowledge that we already have about AI safety. Um, and yet the kind of media narrative and some of the political narrative that's emerging and being amplified by many leaders of large AI companies would suggest that this is some new thing we have just kind of happened upon as a problem. Uh, things like you know, reward hacking by machine learning systems that produce behaviors that are undesirable and not aligned you know, with our intentions is a problem that's been known for over a decade. Uh, so, so the first thing is, if you're only hearing about AI safety this year, um, it's because a lot of this research has not been visible before. But it's very important that we not lose uh, or fail to appreciate what we've already learned about how to make systems safe, trustworthy, reliable, well-governed, fair, accountable, and so on. The other thing is that a lot of the narrative right now is framing safety as a technical challenge that only technical experts can solve, which goes against everything we've ever learned about safety engineering. I used to study engineering ethics before I studied the ethics of robotics and autonomous systems. My first teaching courses in applied ethics were teaching engineers about safety and about the history of safety failures, the history of accidents, and they're almost always caused by human organizational and uh, social factors that technical experts were looking too narrowly to see. And in fact, everything we know from the history of seat belts that weren't designed to protect women or children because assumptions were made that male crash dummies, or that is crash dummies framed upon the, the male frame, or body would be equally protective of all, right? Um, cybersecurity failures are notorious for having complex technical guardrails around a system that are driven right through by a vulnerability that was entirely psychological, like human tendency to pick up a USB stick off the ground and plug it in, <laughs> right? 
Um, pulse oximeters were uh, designed by engineers, but don't work very well for people with darker skin tones, right? Do you think having more engineers in the room would have prevented that? So everything we know about safety engineering tells us that if you want to make systems safe, for God's sake, don't treat it as a purely technical problem and don't think that you can just recruit more technical experts and have safety as the outcome. So, so I think we really need, so the, the, my first point then is we really need a historical view of this problem. Imagining that this problem is something that has just landed in our lap is gonna get us in big trouble. Uh, so we need to learn from the successes and failures of safety engineering in the past. Um, we also need to ask questions about uh, whose safety matters and when, right? So there's been a lot of debate about the kind of long-term narratives that are being pushed uh, by many large tech companies who rightly worry about what kinds of safety challenges we might not be able to anticipate now, but that might surprise us in five or 10 years. That's reasonable, but that is not a good reason to ignore the people who are unsafe from AI systems right now. And unfortunately, some of the rhetoric seems to be pushing us to move our attention to this further horizon at the expense of investing in governance tools and regulation to address the safety challenges that are threatening people's lives and welfare and freedoms right now. So who gets to define what safety means, right? And I'll just point out that um, we really ought to think about the fact that the current AI Safety Summit appears to be focused exactly where powerful tech companies want us to look, and that alone should be an alarming sign. Not because these companies are evil, not because they're malicious, not because they don't care about safety, but because their interests are aligned with holding off regulation for now, right, stalling action on immediate concerns, and preparing for a long-term horizon when regulation will be some other CEO's problem. Right? So that's fine. The incentives for corporations motivate them to that kind of reasoning. It's the job of government to recognize that and counter it in the public interest. And that's what we haven't yet seen really come forward. Uh, recently, uh, yesterday actually, the uh, White House uh, released a uh, notice of an executive order from President Biden identifying some steps that he is taking. Without Congress, these don't have legislative force behind them, but the nice thing about it is they focus on the broad range of concerns uh, that, uh, that we need to govern now, as opposed to just focusing on the long-term horizon. So I think we should take a cue uh, from that approach. So I'll, I'll wrap up with that now, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what others have to say. Thank you. Some incredibly interesting reflections there. And perhaps, Deb, if I could come to you next, um, if that would be all right. Yeah. And we were having a really interesting conversation in the green room about um, this question of uh, uh, how, um, how AI harms are currently sort of reported and perceived in the news and how that sort of um, sh window has shifted in terms of what's currently in focus. Yeah, and um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with a lot of what um, uh, Shannon mentioned, actually. So, uh, yeah, I'm also someone that's sort of been sitting in this responsible AI space for quite some time. And the thing that's remarkable to me is just how um, broad the definition of AI has become and how the current moment sort of ends up defining AI as something very different. Um, so, you know, early 2014, um, uh, you know, the focus was on online platforms. There's a lot of concern around online platforms. And then, um, you know, with the Compass investigation led by ProPublica and some of the work in data journalism, people started realizing that risk assessments were a really important AI application to pay attention to. Um, and then with some of the work that Joy Bowen-Winnie did on facial recognition, people began to see, okay, facial recognition is like the AI technology that we want to address. Um, and, and now, you know, with the release of ChatGPT, folks are very focused on large language models. And we just see the sort of revolving door of what people are deciding to classify as AI and what people are deciding to focus on and uh, define as AI. And that connects almost directly to how people are talking about the safety concerns. Depending on how, what you're, 
looking at as AI that directly correlates to what you're focusing on in terms of the risks and the harms and the language you're using about the concerns. So, um, you know, for example, um, you know, Prime Minister Sindak, when he was giving his speech on the 26th, um, I paid a lot of attention to the language that he was using, you know, reference to frontier models, which we can all think, you know, is a lot of the generative AI, the generative imaging, imaging models, the, you know, chatbots. Um, and, and the types of risks that he was referring to, um, you know, Shannon mentioned these sort of long-term horizon, high-risk, low-probability events, um, you know, connected to this vision of an algorithmic, you know, of an of a artificial general intelligence, that, which has been tied to these chatbots. Um, but I, you know, I was having a conversation in the green room about this. Of, well, this is the same UK where a lot of the A-level fiasco, not to trigger anybody in the room, I know. <laughs> it, wasn't that, it wasn't that long ago for some folks, especially the government folks, I apologize. Um, but you know, the A-level fiasco happened in the UK. Um, you know, I remember reporting about you know, the use of algorithms for visa processing in the UK being incredibly biased. There were protests for both of these events. Um, you know, also, again, not to trigger anybody in the room, but I remember BBC doing a really great um, investigation into the home office's use of facial recognition and how that technology was biased against darker skinned um, visa and passport applicants. And so I think that there has been incredible scandals centered in the UK around AI, but again, the, the definition of that technology keeps shifting and people keep choosing, and again, this is you know perhaps public driven, um, Shannon mentioned there's a corporate incentive in terms of pushing, shifting that definition. But as the definition of AI keeps shifting, we keep neglecting sort of these past cases as, oh, that was a different type of technology. It's like, no, we're talking about the same thing, data-driven technology, data-defined technology. If we're going to classify all of that as AI, then we have to address the, te the, the technological harms um, uh, you know, enacted by all of that category of technology. We can't just ignore the realities of the harms caused by facial recognition or risk assessments because we're choosing to define AI as a chatbot now. Um, and so I think that that's one big concern that I um, always enter the room with is I don't think you can get to scope AI in a way that allows you to ignore the, the risks and the harms that are already perpetuated by previous versions of this technology or previous subsets of this technology. And if you want to talk about a specific subset of it, you have to justify why you're only looking at this and not looking at the other harms that have been perpetuated by you know, a broader range of these technologies. Um, I think the second point I wanted to make was um, a little bit of a back and forth that we had in the green room about um, you know, high, high risk, low probability events. And not, to, not to put anyone on the spot, but I thought that was interesting framing. And I've, I've heard that, again, mentioned in speeches and mentioned in discussions specifically about you know, the focus of the AI task force and the focus of the AI safety summits. Um, I, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, valid concern around these events, but there's also a lot of, you know, a high risk, high probability events. Um, there's been recent reporting by The Guardian about, and Fran mentioned this in her speech, about how prevalent the use of um, AI technology currently is, you know, within the UK government and how, um, you know, I, I think there was an announcement uh, earlier this week, if not late last week, about, you know, aspirations to leverage AI as part of, you know, tax fraud investigations and all of these very real um, world applications. In the US, you know, um, these risk assessments, you know, data-driven risk assessments inform a lot of the criminal justice system, affect people's housing conditions, their access to social services. You know, these are uh, really consequential decisions in the lives of many, many real people. Um, uh, and uh, the reality is that because the technology is already in widespread use, um, those people's lives are at risk today. Um, and so there is um, the reality of the fact that we can't ignore um, uh, the, the present day realities, but also the, the scope of that impact and the individual impact that folks are experiencing. Where um, in the case of, I, I, I can only really speak to the US where I'm more familiar, but you know, I've talked to folks that are you know, fighting against uh, an algorithm that made a decision about them two or three years ago. And, it's, and you know, they're filing bankruptcy because of a decision or a false accusation from an algorithm that had made um, you know, a decision you know, uh, months ago, years ago. And so this is, you know, these are real lives that are impacted in a very material way. Um, and the, the risk that they're facing is a really high probability risk. Um, and it's something that um, uh, you know, uh, has a huge impact on their lives. And so neglecting that 
uh, for the sake of focusing on these lower probability events um, uh, you know, uh, is a little difficult for me to, to watch. Um, and then I'll say the last thing, which is um, uh, connected to this. I think when you're on the ground and you're interacting with a lot of impacted population members, um, I've been very fortunate to interact with civil society a lot more. And, um, you know, they have almost like a direct connection to impacted population members that are confused about what's going on with AI and how it's impacting their lives. Um, there is an urgency to this problem, you know, to Shannon's point around there are systems that are deployed now and there are issues that are the reality of, you know, millions of individuals today. Uh, you know, why are we ignoring them? If you want to focus on this long-term horizon, if you want to focus on these catastrophic risks, I, I actually personally, I, I don't have a problem with, you know, anyone teach their own kind of thing, but, you know, $100 million only on that, why are we not having any investment into the current day situation that folks are facing? And like I mentioned, some of the biggest scandals in the field have occurred in the UK. So, you know, why is it that there's no attention being paid on those individuals and those folks who are facing repercussions, you know, years out into the future. Um, and so I, I just feel like, um, yeah, the urgency of that situation um, uh, is completely subverted by some of the language that I've seen coming out of the government recently. Um, uh, you know, to Shannon's point, uh, the corporations are very quick to co-opt terms, and I've noticed how um, you know, they've been leveraging, again, I don't think this is the intention of the government necessarily, but the companies have definitely, I've been in various interactions where I, I noticed they, they have been leveraging that language of a long-term horizon for AI safety in order to circumvent, you know, current day responsibilities. And I feel like if, you know, if those working on uh, these long-term horizon events, um, uh, you know, don't want to see that co-option happen, then they should collaborate or cooperate with those that are addressing the current day issues as well. Expand the view of what AI safety needs. Include sort of some of the socio-technical concerns. Think about things systematically, uh, but more importantly, address the current day in addition to the long-term views. Thank you so much. Some really important points there, and I think this is a really good point to, to, to bring Yolanda in. Um, I, I guess one thing we're interested in exploring on this panel is whether we can do both. It is striking how much sort of policy attention, media reporting, and so on is is focused on the longer term issues at the mm -hmm. moment. Um, I think there's, there's there's sort of an interesting question, which perhaps I'll come to later, which is sort of to what extent are the tools that we need to manage both similar? Mm -hmm. But Yolanda, if you'd like to kick us off. Yeah, thanks everyone. And I, I agree with a lot of that, and these are all very valid points, but I wanna shift, I wanna disagree on the high level framings and then would love to um, have a discussion around it. Um, it would be great if we could talk about what evidence there are that the that government is circumventing and, um, mm -hmm near ethical concerns at the expense of long-term. And so the $100 million from the UK government is one good example. But this is the first main major event on AI safety. Um, so I view it less like either or, and one is at the expense of the other. And actually that there is a lot of AI policy recommendations which address ethical concerns, fairness, inclusion, as well as safety robustness control, things like red teaming, which can be done for bias um, and security vulnerabilities, third party assessments and independent audits, having a monitoring scheme and mandatory incident reporting, including for open source AI, which is completely out of con like uncontrolled and we should talk about. <coughs> Decommissioning policies, when things don't go well, how do we roll them back, which isn't even impossible for open source AI, more uh, testing, risk management, quality management earlier in the supply chain, not just thinking about it at the deployment stage. So a lot of these address the full range of risks and it would be productive if civil society organizations come together and unite to share some of those very common consensus policy recommendations to policymakers. In the US they get very confused. <laughs> Um, because people are talking about a whole range of risks and they're already low capacity um, and have trouble um, focusing on and passing um, some simple recommendations. And I also want to push back on the narrative that safety is long term. Um, people in the AI safety community no longer think it's long term, right? We've passed the Turing test, so to speak. Um, applications are more advanced than engineers expected them to be, and things like X-Risk and AGI are no longer fringe pun discussions. There are OECD and governments 
as well. And so I think that there's also some straw man arguments happening in this very confusing uh, discourse we're in globally, particularly in the US. I'm based in San Francisco and there's a lot of different dynamics there, uh, which say we're focusing on things 100 years from now, which Big Tech says that too, right? The meta, Meta's leaders say that too. Let's not focus on hypothetical sci-fi 100 years from now. Well, actually, a lot of safety concerns are present right now. We don't have control solved, alignment solved, security, cybersecurity solved. A lot of the frontier labs assume that cybersecurity is going to be solved using AI. Control and alignment will be solved using AI. And those are all big assumptions. Underneath that effect, Today, as we scale AI systems across public sector, private sector, critical infrastructure, and goods and services, as Fran was mentioning in her remarks, these systems will at points fail. And that's because AI is not robust in all environments. It's probability based. They will be hacked because security at this point, cybersecurity is an unsolvable problem, basically, it's offense dominant. Underneath all of this, bringing home that safety risks are near term is malicious use, right? Exploitation, not only of large language models, but including um, for biosecurity threats, cybersecurity threats, et cetera. And then it's not a given that these large labs um, will be properly governed because there is some focus on it at the UK AI summit where there are a lot of different parties represented, including a lot of big tech at all. Actually, right now in the European Union, they, in the AI Act negotiations, the clauses relating to inclusion of foundation models um, is at, are at risk of being taken out by big tech lobbying. So it actually is an important topic that we need to keep focused on. It is important to focus on small SMEs and deployment, but also on these upstream developers. And I'm afraid that if we take our eye off the ball, it'll be really easy for them to capture regulators and say, oh, we don't understand these risks enough. Um, or they're too long term, uh, it's too hard, we don't want to stifle innovation, and they'll be taken out of regulation. And in San Francisco, we know that billions of dollars continue to go into investment for the large frontier AI companies. Uh, so it's, uh, they are not governed. <laughs> and basically, the credible legislation on the horizon right now is the EUA AI Act. And, they're at, and it's a risk that they won't be even included there. So um, I think these are all important discussions. And um, I also had the pleasure of, we work in the EU, but also in the US. They also supported the national AI strategies of Ghana and Rwanda and Tunisia, where we can look at a whole new framing, which is AI for sustainable development goals and AI for good. Um, really important applications, and that brings a whole other question um, to this discussion. But, um, and I want to throw a provocation to talk about open source AI, uh, which I think is going to be the next, next big issue. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Jill, I'll come to you next if that's all right. We've been sure. hearing a lot about <coughs> current risks. Ofcom yeah. is, of course, at least um, or over half a dozen regulators sort of packed under, under one umbrella in terms of the regimes that it looks after with online safety being the sort of one of the newest strings to its, its bow. Um, very much about that interface between um, sort of humans and technology. Um, very interested to hear your reflections on what it's like to, be, to, to sort of be in a current regulator dealing with AI today. Sure, thank you, Michael. And I should say, so Ofcom is one regulator, Sorry. Uh, a converged communications regulator, and actually the advantage of having Ofcom's 20-year history to tackle online safety, which is what we're doing, is, is having uh, colleagues who've really uh, particularly worked with the breadth of issues around freedom of expression for so many years through broadcasting standards. So it, it does, you know, there is a lot of uh, benefit to this, the skills of the technical skills that we have under the hood, if you like. So, yeah, I mean, look, Shannon and Deb in particular talk very much about the sort of the far versus the now uh, and the current day. And I'd say particularly with the King having signed the online safety bill just last week uh, and we are preparing to publish our first set of consultations on how to regulate um, in particular illegal harms online uh, next week. I'm very much living in the current <laughs> uh, of, of how to operationalize the UK's approach of very much regulating the context and the use cases rather than regulating the technologies itself. Um, and if I think in the context of online safety and protecting children 
uh, and their lives online, as well as uh, reducing illegal harm online. Um, the, a lot of that, you know, the underpinnings of both traditional AI, the role of recommender systems, but also generative AI, uh, which has sort of um, it generated a lot more use cases for us to think about during the development of the bill. A lot of that falls into scope of the bill. Uh, and of the Act, and therefore we are preparing imminently to be regulating uh, there starting next week. So I guess a few reflections from me as to how we are doing that and how we are setting about that task. I guess I'd start with uh, an, a reflection of my own, based probably from my time at Google, where I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, a lot of time with en engineering teams and a lot of time running data science teams, is what struck me in particular around generative AI is the speed of rollout, the speed of take up, but the commercial race conditions that the tech firms are operating under. Um, and, and that has posed uh, some questions for us as a regulator in terms of how do we understand the use cases quickly enough, how do we understand the risks that that might involve, um, how do we respond in a really meaningful way. So a couple of the things we're doing. Firstly, we've hired a lot of expertise. Uh, we've been grateful of government funding uh, that has been in the years running up to the regime, and that has allowed us to employ uh, a very large number of uh, engineers, um, computer vision experts, tech policy experts in these areas. What we are doing at the moment is doing a lot of research and evidence in some of these um, more, either more no novel risks or some of the technologies or, or systems and processes being deployed to reduce the risk. Uh, we're doing papers at the moment on deep fake detection, uh, the effectiveness of red teaming, um, and a lot thinking and work around the opportunities and risks of open source models in particular. Uh, and some of the downstream risks uh, where, where you have less people who, who might be trained and deployed in, the, in, in risk management as they roll out uh, new applications on the basis of open source models. So I think one of the things that's really important to, for us to do is to do a lot of research and effectiveness work and make sure that our, um, our proposals are really based on a solid foundation of evidence. Um, I think to do that, we really understand and welcome and try and spend time with uh, innovators in industry who are really looking at the latest um, uh, ways in which they can, um, they can reduce the risk of harm, either from traditional um, uh, sort of um, algorithms being deployed, which can create, um, really affect how children the content that children see online and, and as you mentioned quite rightly the sort of more profound deeply individual uh, negative experiences that can result of that um, so you know and we spend time with we've spent time you know with snap on uh, who who have rolled out keyword blockers on my ai we spent time with tiktok understanding how they are uh, amending their terms and conditions for certain types of synthetic media to, to prevent that from being on the platform or to take it down when it is, uh, and looking very carefully at the rollout of generative AI into mainstream search uh, as that is happening currently. It's a, in many countries, it's still in beta phase, uh, but moving to an open rollout in the UK, if not before Christmas afterwards. Uh, so we spend time, a lot of time with the technical teams and the broader teams of firms to really understand those innovations. Um, so where appropriate, the best practice can be more widely adopted. Um, but there will, of course, in this, you know, much, as I've said, much of this is in scope. Um, and therefore, we hope to um, to take to, to really be on the front foot, but also to share our learnings widely. There will, of course, be regulatory gaps as the use cases evolve. Um, and what we will do there is work very closely with government uh, so that they can consider in a targeted way how those regulatory gaps might be addressed in future years. It is really important for us to work with others. Uh, you mentioned kindly the DRCF, the, the Digital Regulators Forum in the UK, where I used to be chief exec. We do a huge amount of work there. Indeed, the government has just given the DRCF uh, two million of funding uh, to set up a new uh, digital hub 
where innovators can test with multiple regulators um, uh, uh, new areas where they can receive, um, they can access m how it might work in different regulatory environments um, so that they're not potentially getting one answer from one regulator and another from another. So I think some of those areas are really important, but we also work globally. And I just want to finish there because this is undoubtedly a global issue. Some of the risks that we're seeing today um, and to bring it back to the current, uh, a really sharp rise in um, deep fake child sexual abuse material, for example, that is seen by all of my fellow regulators in other countries. Um, and therefore it's really important from Australia to Fiji to South Africa um, and beyond. And it's really important that we uh, share learnings and also come together to share our research and our evidence as to which mitigations and innovations might be really effective in reducing these very here and now risks of harms. Thank you so much. And that's a great moment to pass over to Emran finally. Um, DSIT's obviously had a big hand in organizing the summit itself. Very keen to hear your thoughts on where government thinking is now and where it's going. Yeah, no, thanks very much, Michael. Uh, and look, it's really, it's really good to be here and to be part of uh, this fringe. There's a really important set of issues being discussed <coughs> as part of it, including on this panel. And I think it's been really important to me to, to listen to the conversation so far, but to engage as, as part of the fringe. Um, all that said, I think probably the first thing I should do is explain a little bit the choice that we've made in terms of focusing where we have for the summit itself. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I think I'll contest some of the consequences of that focus that perhaps other panelists have drawn out. Mm -hmm. So the reason for focusing um, in the way that we have done for the Safety Summit is that our view is that um, there was not a sufficiently well-developed conversation taking place about safety at the frontier of AI um, between uh, the widest possible range of companies, countries, and civil society. That conversation was um, needed development. Um, so there was uh, a really powerful conversation taking place in the G7, um, so a kind of much broader, uh, a narrower range of countries, um, but a really important conversation, a conversation that has led to a, a code of conduct that's been published yesterday for consultation and for adoption, um, a wider conversation and a broader conversation that was taking place through the global partnership on AI. Um, but there wasn't as much of a focused conversation happening on frontier AI and frontier AI safety amongst those three groups of people, countries, companies, and civil society. And that's what we wanted to make sure was happening. And that was the reason that the prime minister convened the AI safety summit. So I, I, I feel like, you know, without wanting to be defensive about it, I feel like it's, it's important to clarify why we focused in that way for the summit itself. Um, but I don't accept that the consequence of focusing in that way for the summit is saying in any way that we don't think there's another set of issues that is really, really important. Um, clearly, there are lots of other important issues here. Um, we've been trying to, to, to address some of those issues. We published a white paper on AI uh, early in the year. That paper had a much wider scope. Uh, I think a lot of the issues that have already been raised on this panel and as part of this fringe uh, we were trying to lay down some lines of thought in the white paper on that, uh, and we will follow up on it. Um, we've been running a set of events on the run-up to the summit where we've been engaging much more broadly. Um, so, for example, we've run events with the British Academy, uh, with the Turing Institute, with Tech UK, with the Royal Society, uh, where we've been trying to cast a much wider conversation, recognizing, I think, a lot of the points that have been made on this panel, that we need a much wider conversation, as well as the, the focused conversation that we're trying to have at the summit itself. And look, just to build on that a little bit, um, I feel like one of the things I should say is that um, I lead this work within a Department for Science, Innovation, and Technology and lead a group of civil servants who, as well as thinking about AI safety and AI policy more broadly construed, I also lead teams that work on data, uh, that work on data governance, that work on online safety. Um, uh, and work on um, data ethics and innovation in that. Um, because all of these issues are absolutely connected. And it's really important that we as policymakers inside government are advising ministers on this set of issues taken together. Um, and to give you a couple of examples of that, at the same time as we've been focusing hard on AI safety, we have also, uh, in the last couple of weeks, launched uh, a funding round uh, to continue to seek and to fund innovation in identifying the best ways to ensure fairness in the development of AI. 
So there's a fairness innovation challenge that's live at the moment through Innovate UK and through our Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, um, because that's a really important part of this mix as well. Um, and as Jill has talked uh, about, uh, the online safety dimension of this, I think, is really important as well. And we're working really closely with Ofcom following the royal assent of the online safety bill um, on the implementation of that regime. I think then probably just the, the, the kind of the third thing I wanted to, to talk a little bit about in my introductory remarks is to address, um, I think, you know, Deb put the challenge really well. Um, we're spending a lot of money. The, the Prime Minister in his speech last week talked about us spending 100 million pounds on uh, AI, the AI Frontier Task Force and turning that into a safety institute. Why are we spending quite so much money on that compared to other things that we might be doing? Um, well, I think the fundamental reason for that is, um, uh, and Yolanda made the point really well, is that these safety issues are beginning to present right now. Um, uh, they present right now through the current generation of models. Um, and we know enough at this stage about the training that is happening and the development that is happening of the next generation of models to know that these are all models that present right now. Um, and we don't in the public sector, and I think this is true of a number of countries, not only of the UK, uh, we don't have sufficient capability and we don't have enough uh, scientific expertise uh, in what ensuring safety in those frontier models needs to look like. Uh, and that's why we're investing in it. And that's why we, we as the UK really want to be at the forefront of investing on that. Uh, and that's what the Prime Minister was talking about in his speech last week. Um, I've got a large team of policymakers already. Uh, there's a lot of issues we need to do some really, really hard work on. Uh, we signaled a lot of those in the white paper and we're doing lots of follow-up work on those and lots of conversations going on, including with people, I'm sure, in this audience. But what we haven't had is that level of scientific capability to really study the issues at the frontier of AI safety and to figure out how best are we going to manage those issues. Um, that's why we've invested so much in building up that capability. That's why we brought in people like Ian Hogarth as chair of that task force, and why Ian and that team has been really successful in bringing in a whole set of researchers from civil society, from academia, uh, excuse me, as well as from some of the firms uh, in order to allow us to keep building that capability. Um, we saw in the US's executive order yesterday that the US is now also wanting to develop that scientific capability within the administration. Uh, and that's exactly the move that we've made. Uh, and I think we need to keep going on that because these safety issues are beginning to present now. And in order to ensure public confidence uh, about those issues, in order to ensure safe deployment and public confidence about all the possible benefits of AI, I think we need to project real confidence and real capability about managing those issues at the frontier. Thank you so much. And that brings me very neatly onto my first question. So we've, we've talked a lot about the problems that we need to address. We've talked about how um, there needs to be a, a breadth in that analysis and, and, and not just a narrow focus. I'm interested in what we need from our regulatory ecosystem to actually get there and what gaps there might be. Um, there, was a, there was a huge amount of work that went into the white paper, but in some senses it was slightly unfortunately timed with the sort of the, the publication of ChatGPT with the sort of the arrival of, of, of this sort of more, more powerful class of models that have disrupted the sort of plan, um, regulatory plans across the globe from Europe's product safety approach to, um, to, to the UK's um, proposals. Interested in the panel's thoughts about what does the regulatory ecosystem need in terms of powers? Is it properly equipped, for example, to look up value chains at developers properly? Um, and we heard from Fran also that um, you know if, we, if we're using this lens of safety, then the, the sort of the resourcing that we um, that we protect those those sort of critical technologies and industry with is um, often you know very large, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of pounds of, of, of expenditure a year for those regulators. Is that the right scale that we should be thinking about? Would anyone like to kick us off? Please, Shannon. So um, <coughs> I'll start off by saying first of all. Uh, talking about the white paper, um, I mean, I think one of the things that lots of people saw as a strength of the white paper is it understands that AI is not one technology, <coughs> but many different technologies, and even the same technical uh, kind of model will have very different effects and consequences when applied in different environments and contexts. So the idea of a kind of sector-driven approach where 
we make use of the regulatory knowledge we have about particular sectors and who needs to be protected and what the vulnerabilities are and then adding the capability to understand what AI does to that makes a great deal of sense, right? Um, but I think one of the challenges in that approach is that when you looked at the white paper, one of the gaps that everyone I know saw in looking at it is where are the incentives for companies to take action? What are the costs to them of ignoring this guidance and advice, right? So you can have all kinds of wonderful guidance and practices, but if you're not willing to impose costs on people who don't comply with those practices, in a case where you have these kinds of market race conditions that we've been talking about, the, you know exactly what the end result is going to be. It is as predictable, right, as, as a clock. It's just going to happen that those um, requirements are going to be neglected. So I think the biggest gap that we have in the regulatory system right now, it's not a knowledge gap, it's not an expertise gap. As I've been saying, we actually have been collecting knowledge about how to manage most of these risks, much of which can be applied to frontier models. Red teaming is something we were talking about five years ago. This is not something we invented for frontier models, right? So we have a lot of knowledge, we have a lot of expertise. It's, a, it's not narrowly technical expertise. It was built by computer scientists and data scientists working with ethicists and social scientists and designers pooling their knowledge in teams of mixed capability that built a lot of this infrastructure within tech companies. Lots of the, I used to work at Google and we had some really cool stuff that came out of the work uh, that our team did and the, also the uh, team that uh, Timnit uh, uh, Gebru and Meg Mitchell uh, were on. Uh, Raman Chattery built all kinds of amazing things at Twitter while she was there. But those teams are gone, right? So where is the incentives for these companies to reinvest in the knowledge they themselves started to create. They were able to lay off many of those teams or, or disempower many of those internal guardrails because there was no consequence for them doing otherwise and it helped them address the kind of race to capture the market uh, without being slowed down by internal people saying, hey, wait, we need to make sure this is safe first. So, what I would like to see in the regulatory system are clear incentives for companies to be responsible actors. And most companies would actually welcome that as long as it didn't put them at a competitive disadvantage, right? If the bar is raised for everybody, actually everybody wins. And we've seen this in other regulatory environments. This is how it worked in civil aviation. Airplanes used to drop out of the sky every week in the 1960s. It was flying was a really scary thing, right? It's now safer than driving. Now, did that happen because of just letting a sort of laissez-faire market environment and market incentives rule the day? No, it happened because of safety regulation and severe penalties for companies that didn't build strong safety cultures internally. Did we sacrifice innovation to get safety? We did not. <clears throat> Planes got more efficient, they flew faster, flying became more affordable, right? Passenger uh, counts went up, more people fly than ever before. No one would say that innovation in aviation stopped when we started regulating. So in most industries, historically, regulation improves trust in the product, increases adoption because the risk is not externalized onto people who use the technology. Now, today, if you want someone to use AI, you have to say good luck to you, because if it goes wrong, it's really on you. No one else is going to pay for it. So we have to think about where those incentives are coming from. Thank you very much. I'm going to bring in Yolanda and anyone. And yeah. Yeah, Dan, thank you. Yeah, so completely agree. The days of um, Microsoft puts out their ethical principles or whoever, everybody, everybody had ethical principles. The G20 endorsed the OECD AI principles. 100 plus countries, the, the UNESCO recommendations for AI, that that'll, in a push comes to shove market competitive dynamic um, be sufficient, it's completely over, and we need the binding regulation with teeth. Um, and that can include liability too. So for example, for open source developers, Meta and others, um, Mistral in France came out now with the open source large model as well. 
they have no liability or accountability for how those models are used after they're deployed. So we don't, so even if it's not legislation, which might be slow, there could be other schemes, liability agencies, um, et cetera. And it'll be important to have the monitoring and the enforcement capacity to do this. So maybe we have the knowledge to set the recommendation, let's beef up the monitoring and enforcement. But I think that there isn't even a consensus that we need regulation, so that should be established. I think that there is among us, but maybe not um, among industry, for example, which says, oh, we don't understand these risks, which is like, that's a reason to regulate you. Like, just because your engineers don't know how it works, that doesn't mean just go and do whatever you want, right? Imagine in aviation if that was an excuse. Like, that's, um, yeah, so looking forward to seeing how these shape out, and we're advising the code of conduct as well, and. Um, international um, principles, which are great in the interim, but these really have to be adopted towards binding regulation. Thanks. Thanks very much. Jill, I think you wanted to come in. So, yeah, I'll just come in on sort of enforcement powers, I think, because I think in the UK, the approach we've gone down, which is the government have gone down, which is sort of empowering the existing regulators and, and, and adding legislation where legislation is needed means that the enforcement powers that those regulators have kick in and then new enforcement powers are introduced. So, so as I mentioned for the Online Safety Act, a lot of these use cases are in scope. There is much in scope. Uh, deep fake being used for illegal, illegal harms is in scope. Uh, generative AI into search is in scope. A lot of recommender systems and pushing harm out is in scope. And the enforcement powers that we have are significant. You know, it, it's, it's fines at a global turnover level, it's senior manager liability, uh, and it is um, the powers to disrupt services. Um, so significant powers. Likewise, if I think of the ICO, uh, their, their data protection rules, for example, kick in when, whenever firms use personal data to train models and to train large language models, and they have enforcement powers there. So I, I, I think the, you know, the, if, if you're relying on the biggest gap being sort of the incentives of firms, I would say I think there are significant powers uh, to really tackle that. Where we are, what we are doing is making sure that we can get the new legislation signed last week uh, really into practice as soon as possible, and that starts with our publications next week. Um, yeah, I think that was an excellent response, Jill. I, I was going to say something similar where um, if you look at the, the text, the full text for the executive order actually did come out yesterday as well. Um, and um, if, you, if you look at that document, um, a lot of it is attempting to direct agencies, direct the Department of Commerce, the Department of Homeland Security on um, actions that they can take within the scope of their existing powers, but effectively giving them permission to apply those existing powers in the context of AI and effectively um, uh, lean into uh, their, their, their role as enforcers and regulators within a broader consumer protection landscape and noticing and understanding that AI is, again, you know, just another engineered product um, that they also have authority over. Um, so yeah, I think, I think um, it's it, interesting to hear from you, Jill, that that's a similar sort of approach in the UK where a lot of the legislative direction has been to just um, empower existing enforcers. Something I wanted to flag also was to pay attention to sort of the types of um, like legal action and, and government action that has actually been happening. I think there's been a lot of bills. Uh, I, I'm again speaking from a U.S. perspective. I apologize, um, but there's 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 quite a few bills, and so I think sometimes the discourse around AI policy in the U.S. at least is really oriented or concerned around what's in these bills, what's in a lot of these proposals. But in terms of what actually has probability of passing, um, I think one of the highest probability bills on the table right now um, uh, sprung out from the Senate around the Create AI Act, um, which is very oriented around um, you know, funding. Um, because of the way that the legislative arm is operating, it's quite partisan, and there's a lot of difficulty in getting bipartisan cooperation on various topics. You know, if you try to give more power to the FTC, then maybe one party doesn't like that, et cetera. And so the easiest thing to do, the lowest hanging fruit is um, funding proposals. And it, I, I mentioned in Sunak's speech, I noticed that that was a really huge focus for him as well, was funding. Um, and I think that's something that we don't necessarily talk enough about is, you know, if the easiest thing to do, if the lowest hanging fruit in terms of government action at this moment is funding, how much of that funding is going towards 
increasing regulatory capacity, increasing civil society capacity to push back against some of these applications that we're seeing uh, versus how much of that funding is going towards you know, a narrower scope of concerns or going towards the companies themselves and making it easier for them. Um, so I think that's one thing to flag is that a lot of the actual sort of tractable uh, government action has been around funding and it's really important, um, especially for the journalists in the room to track exactly what those funding commitments are. The second thing I wanted to flag was something that was alluded by a couple folks, which is a lot of voluntary commitments. Um, the White House um, put together a group of, of, of companies that put together you know, voluntary commitments. Um, I know, um, I'm not sure if that's gonna be the strategy in the UK, I know the government's been a lot more involved here. Um, but um, uh, yeah, a lot of the companies are advocating for you know, self-organized forums. OpenAI has put together a Frontier AI forum of their own and they've pulled a bunch of companies together. And again, I, I think it's interesting and great to see companies you know, collaborating to be able to establish best practices and communicate with one another. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The aviation industry, that's a lot of the incentive around which they establish their own best practices. Um, but I've had personal experience, especially with my advocacy on the facial recognition front, where we pushed for you know, um, minimizing the use of facial recognition in high stakes applications like immigration and policing because of how poorly it worked for darker skinned you know, female subjects. Um, and um, uh, in response to that advocacy, a lot of what we received, like summer of 2019, 2020, um, was you know, voluntary commitments from these companies, voluntary recalls where the companies were saying, oh, you know, because of some of the reputational cost incurred by this critique and this advocacy, these campaigns, you know, we're gonna pull our product off of the market. And at the time, in civil society, we celebrated that as a win. Oh my gosh, we got the companies to take voluntary action you know, um, to, to, to recall some of these products in the most high stakes use cases that we were worried about. And it's been years since that moment. And um, I've since learned, you know, that we can't rely on these voluntary commitments as, you know, the final frontier in terms of action against these companies. A lot of those companies have now repackaged their products. Um, a kind of popular example is Amazon, you know, making the voluntary commitment to not sell their facial recognition product to police. But that was their, you know, API product um, that that they, that had a facial recognition model behind it. They now have these sort of smart doorbells where they have facial recognition capability and footage, and they have police partners, um, and those police partners pay into access to that information and to that product. Again, it's the, it's it's not the same product, right? The the official sort of facial analysis product is not being directly sold to police, but um, they've created loopholes for themselves in how they set up their moratorium and how they set up their voluntary commitments so that they can still um, not lose market share in that facial recognition space. And so I feel like I've, um, I've, I've, I've gone through the phase of you know, being excited about voluntary commitments and realizing that if we allow the companies to set up those voluntary commitments and set the terms of use in terms of uh, you know, how they engage on this topic and what their responsibilities are, um, you know, they will always create loopholes for themselves. Um, and so that's something that um, I'd also encourage folks in the room to pay attention to um, as we move in that direction policy-wise. Thank you very much. Um, this is an incredibly rich discussion, but we are running short on time as a result. So I'm going to come to Emran, and then hopefully I'm going to get a couple of uh, questions from the audience in before we wrap up. Emran, I appreciate it might be, you might be constrained in what you can say ahead of a white pub, the white paper response publication. Um, but we heard last week that the government doesn't want to rush to regulate. We've been talking a lot here about uh, powers, about equipping institutions to react. Um, and those powers currently do vary enormously across the, the sort of the regulatory ecosystem. Is it not possible to, to look at these gaps in regulatory capability and legislate for those without having to create sort of an inflexible rule book that, that, that the government doesn't want to um, go down that road? Yeah, so look, a, a, couple of, a couple of thoughts on that and picking up some of the points that have just been made in the latest set of contributions. Um, I think the first is to recognize that um, the firms, and I don't, I, you know, I, I won't try and track the full history of kind of where the firms have been on this stuff, um, but I think it is worth saying that we asked the leading firms to publish their latest safety processes in the run up to the summit and they have done so. Um, the firms themselves have organized, uh, I think Deb, as you were saying, a frontier models forum based in the US. Um, but we, we don't think that is enough, actually. Uh, we think we do need to have public sector capability to understand what best practice in safety looks like. Um, 
and to keep studying and keep deepening that question, which is why we're investing in creating that capability. So we're not looking to the firms alone to do this, but I think it is welcome uh, that the firms are taking this seriously as well. Um, I think just the second thing I want to draw out is, and it goes back to Shannon's observation, I think, that some of the foundation models that we're talking about here are foundations, right? So they're foundations for products and services and tools that span lots of very different sectors of the economy. Mm -hmm. And that is fundamentally the reason why we took the approach that we did in the AI white paper, um, which is let's follow um, those products, tools, and services and regulate for where those might be having adverse outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, you know, kind of where the work on online safety comes in. It's where the Information Commissioner's Office has a locus, but also a really wide range, actually, of sector regulators have got a locus uh, on dealing with those issues. That does mean when we talk about AI regulation, you end up with quite a long answer, um, <laughs> because you're talking about something that is, 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 is basically economy-wide and so draws on quite a wide range of actors. But at the same time, we think that is a recognition of the nature of this technology and the way in which the technology is being deployed and will continue to be deployed. Um, but Michael, going back to your question, um, I think we absolutely want to continue to understand how ready are regulators, um, uh, how adept are they in using the powers that they have, what additional capability do they need in order to be able to do that, um, and where might the powers fall short? Um, and I think if we find instances of that, um, then we want to address those. Um, I think just the point at the moment is we laid out in the AI white paper an approach, and we want to follow that approach, and there's quite a lot of work to do to, to follow that approach. Thank you. And um, I, will, I, will, I, I would love to come back on, on, on a lot <laughs> of that, but I think it will uh, take up the remainder of our time. So. Um, if we do have any questions from the floor, please do put your hand up. We're a little bit, oh, plenty of questions. Um, have one here at the front. I think I'll probably take a couple um, and see how far we get with the time. And we have one over here, gentleman in the middle of the row. Thank you. Um, I'm Rob Proctor from University of Warwick and the Alan Turing Institute. We've heard a lot of talk about regulation today as if we believe that's going to be the solution. Um, I think the public's entitled to be a bit skeptical about that. Just thinking back, for example, to uh, aviation, despite the record of safety, we all know about the, uh, the failure of regulation when it came to the Boeing 737 MAX, where the regulator, the FAA, was effectively captured by Boeing and passed through changes to a software system without properly scrutinizing it. Closer to home, um, I think the British public will be well aware of the failures of regulatory bodies such as Ofwat to properly uh, ensure that the uh, that water companies properly um, discharge their duties instead of discharging effluent. Um, and also, uh, we have, a, I think, a, a push at the moment on the part of government to increase the use of facial recognition technology in retail spaces. So I wonder just how much confidence we can have that regulators um, take, on the, that take on the role of ensuring that AI is being applied ethically and safely are going to be able to act with true independence from pressures from companies and pressures from government who want to use AI uh, to, to develop new products or to solve uh, social economic problems. Thank you very much. And we'll take another, I think over here, please. And then we'll see how far we get with the time. Hey, I'm um, Bhargav uh, from IPPR, Senior Research Fellow there. And just uh, last week we put out a report on uh, three policy pillars we think that the government can take to uh, think of how AI can contribute to positive public value. I just wanted to say thank you very much for uh, your discussions. We're actually very much at IPPR on the same page with a lot of things. Like, we definitely believe we need much stronger, larger uh, regulatory body, more than 1,000 people maybe, similar to financial regulation, actively involved. We cannot, of course, let them decide what they want to do. Um, and on that note, uh, but slightly, slightly different from the concept of safety, 
you know, some we talked about corporate interests more broadly and letting kind of free market interests decide the direction of uh, how AI is being used. Uh, I'm also wondering, one of the things we called for in our uh, IPPR policy report was uh, like an industrial policy, which very much focuses on the directions of uh, AI being used for us. So, you know, assuming that, for example, with social media, we let th them decide how things go, it's going to be basically a massive advertising platform. You know, what do we do to make sure that similar things don't happen where any AI which is being developed, sure, they have some kind of uh, public value stuff, but more broadly, it's just focused for making profit or selling facial recognition to cops. So how do we, well, you know, what kind of industrial policies would you potentially think of, you know, maybe subsidies, taxes, uh, to make sure that we have these technologies being used very actively for, say, climate or health in a way which does not just benefit themselves and, uh, you know, just corporate interests. Thank you very much. Thank you. Two really great questions there. One around how we avoid regulatory capture, and I think an interesting expansion of that is also not just regulatory capture, but institutional capture. Government's working in a really interesting way, bringing an awful, with the task force as well, bringing an awful lot of um, expertise on board. Some of that is coming from academia, some of that is coming from civil society, but a lot of it is also coming from industry, and that may well get rolled into um, the new AI Safety Institute. So an interesting set of questions there, and then also this question about positive public value or benefit. How do we secure that in the long term? Is there a role for industrial policy? Thank you. I can perhaps uh, them first. Yep, Jill. Shall I, I think lead on first? So I'll come around to everyone. I'll give, a, I'll give a short answer on the first. So I think, firstly, it's really, really important to learn from regulatory failures. And I think learning is, is a critical kind of feedback loop for us all in terms of sort of how we tackle some of these issues of regulatory capture and potential de-risking regulatory failure from within Ofcom, uh, I'll just mention a few. Firstly, we recruit very diverse teams from very different perspectives. So yes, we have some people from platforms and yes, we have some people from who've come from the civil service, but we also have people who've come from frontline harm organizations. We've got uh, child uh, uh, social workers in our team. We've got ex mec police. We've got, you know, all sorts of kind of uh, skill sets that we have brought together. And with that, no one person makes a decision in Ofcom, it, all decisions are sort of jointly made and owned. So, so we make sure that we have that right. We also are independent of government government and we have independence baked into our governance structure. We have an independent chairman, we have independent non-executives on the board, we have a number of advisory committees as well. And then back to the learnings, in everything we do, we do uh, really detailed sort of lessons learned and wash-ups at the end and feed that back through so that we are constantly iterating and improving in the way that we gather evidence, in the way that we consult, in the way that we're making really fair decisions. These are a critical uh, to being a trusted regulator, and for Ofcom, that's been earned over 20 years. Thank you. Yeah. Deb, and then I'll go to Yolanda. Um, yeah, just to sort of uh, piggy off of that, um, I think there's a lot of ways in which regulators um, that are operating with AI or in the AI space now or find themselves <laughs> dealing with AI um, can learn from past failures. So when it comes to auditing and third-party assessment, for example, um, uh, I've been doing a lot of research on lessons to learn from a similar movement in finance and food safety for medical devices, um, issues around auditor independence. Um, you can design sort of a policy ecosystem to address some of these things. You know, like Jill mentioned some of these things of like an oversight body, conduct standards in addition to product standards. Um, and so there, there has been sort of a history of regulatory failures, but we can learn from it to build the sort of policy infrastructure through which regulation is more likely to be successful as an accountability mechanism. And so I wanted to bring that up. Uh, something else I did want to bring up separately, um, I know I, I feel like I've been talking a lot about funding today, but um, uh, you know, academia and civil society should not be underestimated. Also journalism, there's been um, some great sort of data journalism from folks at the markup and ProPublica that have been really critical in terms of highlighting some of the failures of this technology and some of the harms perpetuated by this technology and collecting sort of material statistical evidence of some of that harm. Um, uh, and, you know, in the US, we have a huge sort of issue around supporting building capacity within civil society and academia 
um, or, or just other accountability actors that might be in a position to inform litiga litigation or inform other sort of accountability actions when a technology fails. And I feel like in order for us to have proper accountability, we shouldn't just rely on regulators. There should be a broader ecosystem of these accountability actors participating um, in this conversation and being empowered to participate in this conversation. So for example, in the US, you know, we have these um, NSF, um, this, that's the National Science Foundation. You know, they funded these AI institutes and the collective, I, I think now there's sort of almost 30 of these AI institutes nas nationwide and a collective, uh, uh, you know, funding for that entire group of uh, university institutes is about half a billion dollars. Um, and compare this to, you know, the announcement that came out, you know, last week of, uh, you know, three billion dollars going into Anthropic um, uh, from Google, and four billion dollars earlier into Anthropic, and ten billion dollars from Microsoft into OpenAI. And so, in terms of just capacity to participate in the conversation, um, uh, you know, academia has found that it's been incredibly uh, kind of hemorrhaged of its capacity to, to to do that safety research or even to build and participate as as an actor in this space. Similar with civil society, um, you know, the leadership conference uh, for civil rights, which is sort of a really big convener of civil society in the U.S., um, just started a center of technology, you know, about a month ago. Um, AFL-CIO, which is one of the biggest union organizers in the U.S., um, just started an institute of technology, and so they're just ramping up on these topics and. Um, they're incredibly uh, under-resourced in terms of their capacity to push back. And so uh, I just wanted to highlight those other actors as critical um, infrastructure in terms of actually getting to accountability as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to become a very strict chair <laughs> give the rest of our uh, panel a, a chance to respond. Um, in 30 seconds or yeah. less, Yolanda. So empower civil society. Let's unite. Um, let's subsidize and target and maybe offer moonshots to solve real problems. I'm in San Francisco, super smart people, like making dumb apps. Like if we could <laughs> like point them towards solving sustainable development goals, not just ad placement on this one app, mm -hmm. that would go far. Uh, in Rwanda's national AI strategy, for example, we singled uh, moonshot projects for SDGs. And I just wanna close and um, uh, regulation for upstream foundation model providers also helps the downstream small SMEs developers because they don't have transparency about how these upstream models work or if they can trust them, and they don't have the resources um, and necessarily capacity to do all of the ethical tests and safety tests and security tests themselves. Ed. Shannon. Uh, I'll just go on this second question because, um, oh, sorry, Shannon. No, you no, go first. No, no, we'll go. Me. That's uh, fine. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to come in on the second question because we've talked a lot about risk and mitigation of risk. We haven't talked a lot about potential and management for potential. Um, and so just two very quick thoughts. The first is, I think alongside private companies making massive investments in compute, which they're doing for commercial reasons, I think we do need to think quite carefully about what are the public investments in compute that then allows scientific and public use cases. Um, so I think that would be part of uh, how we manage for potential. And then the second would be thinking about where are the places where we think there might be insufficient development uh, for public sector good, um, and how do we fill that gap? Uh, which is why in the last few days we've talked about investing more on healthcare use cases. Thank you very much. Shannon, Sorry, Shannon. please. So just on the point of regulatory capture, and thanks for those examples, um, I think actually it's very instructive to look at the cases where it shows us how well regulation works. Why is a Boeing... Uh, a regulatory capture event so shocking and rare, right? Because it doesn't happen every week. Uh, it, because it's very costly. Boeing lost a ton of sales to Airbus for years, not to mention a number of other expensive consequences, right? So actually, I think this tells us that regulation works when you make it very expensive for companies uh, to uh, capture and undermine the safety processes that those systems are meant to create. Uh, versus places where you see the, the regulatory capture being chronic, then you know you don't have the incentives right. So we can learn from that. And then the last thing is just thanks to the uh, question, to the person who raised the question about uh, AI that actually serves the public interest. There's so much untapped potential there. And it really concerns me as someone who actually wants to see AI develop and succeed that I see public attitudes turning against it, mm -hmm. in part because people don't feel protected from it, but also because it's not doing that much for them yet. It's not solving the deep problems that they really have. And we have so much potential for that. So subsidies and investment in that is where I think government should be, should be looking. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So this has been an incredibly valuable discussion. Um, our hope is that today's session will give us all some lenses through which to interpret the events and announcements 
and ongoings of this week. Um, thank you to the organisers, Milltown, to the British Library for hosting us, to our audience in the room and online. And finally, please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Thank you.